Technology is often presented as a genius boffin in some back room who has a simply marvelous idea and then manages to get this idea made and here we have the microprocessor, a great benefit to mankind and anybody that stands in its way is standing in the way of progress. Well, in all the cases that I can think of, the technology is presented as though it is going to liberate people from all the boring, routine, back-breaking tasks that they've been engaged in. And the impression is usually given that this will mean that they'll be free to use their creativity to the full, to satisfying, worthwhile, thoughtful jobs. The microprocessor and the ensuing computer revolution hold the promise of shorter working weeks, more leisure time, and an increasingly affluent society. All this, coupled with cheaper international travel, will allow us to explore our world more fully, seeing that life is rich with the possibilities of enjoyment, from the most basically physical to the cultural, artistic, and creative. So, perhaps one feature of our community of the future will be a center for human achievement, a building where people can make a choice, where they can be matched by computer with the best outlet for their abilities. People, millions and millions of people, may disappear from the rat race. Machines will replace so many jobs, the drudgery of daily life may be the struggle to find things to do, filling in the time, utilizing our leisure. Every car on the American road, every new building that towers against the sky, is a sign of our progress towards a better way of life. We have accomplished much, but the achievements to come will dwarf our own. The American road stretches ahead of us, always towards a new horizon. We are all traveling along that road, all moving forward towards an even better tomorrow. It's implied that this is part of an inevitable progress, that it's automatically going to improve the quality of our working lives, that it is progress in the widest sense of the word that's going to lead to greater prosperity and so on. Progress. Second World War, the Americans began a massive program of investment in scientific research to come up with lightweight computers for missile weapons systems. Out of this research was born a revolutionary new technology, the computer on a silicon chip. It was cheaper, faster and more reliable than the first computer systems and big companies rapidly recognized the potential of microelectronics. Throughout the 60s and 70s, many industries developed computer control production. In Japan, America and Europe, the big companies worked towards the fully automated factory, serviced by automated warehousing, distribution and retail systems. Please keep it quiet, studio. We're trying to camera rehearse. Uh, Meanwhile, back in Britain, we are told of the dire consequences if we do not introduce these new technologies. Countries which get in quickly on the robot revolution will reap tremendous rewards. Those who lag back will become steadily less competitive. And if we do not invest, in word processing and as I said these other areas in the way that I've described then we will simply not be competitive. If we don't move now and move very very quickly both large and small companies alike I think we, we run a major risk of losing competitiveness. We still have time uh, to stay in this race if we run very hard now. They seem to be presenting it as inevitable. 
we cannot stop it. We must get in this race. Britain must be in this race or else we'll be left behind, you know. This race has already been won by America and Japan. I mean, even if we join this race, no way can we hope to keep up with these people. Have we got to join this race? At the moment, there is a severe crisis of profitability within industries in, in Western countries. They're having to put more and more capital, more and more people, to extract the same amount of profit from the production process. The Conservative Political Centre sees microelectronics as the way out. They say... The semiconductor revolution offers a way out of the multiple crises we face. Lord Spence, in the House of Lords, explains why. Silicon chips do not belong to unions. They do not go on strike. They do not ask for more and more pay. They do not need holidays, nor heated offices, nor tea breaks. They are very reliable and do not make mistakes. They need very little space in which to function. They are very cheap. They use very little energy. And they are here now, waiting to be brought into use. We are now in a period in which production itself is being reorganized to bypass, to squeeze out labor from the productive process, whether it's production on a factory, whether it's in an office. And microelectronics is a key technology at the moment to enable the capitalist to squeeze out or to regiment labor much more. They're eliminating human energy and human intelligence by machines. And the reason they do this is they believe that by reducing labor costs, that is the wages that are paid to the workers, that will render their industry more efficient. In the United States today, productivity uh, is, has become the status of almost a major ideological war. Uh, management raises the flag of increased productivity. The workforce is supposed to salute. Uh, very often the question, however, is not productivity, but one of control. That is, management would like to exert increased control over the workforce in the long run to maximize profit. Well, naturally, it's plain to see. Progress means productivity. You must be crazy if you disagree with profitability. In the automobile industry in the United States, uh, the Society of Manufacturing Engineers predicted that in, in the building of automobiles by 1985, one out of every five jobs would be replaced in the direct assembly of a car by robots. And they went on to say that by 1995, one out of every two jobs would be replaced by robots. Take a bow, T3. Here, Cincinnati Millicron, a robot manufacturer, explain in their publicity film why robots are so attractive for their customers in the car industry. You don't need to write any programs, punch tapes, or perform complex calculations. All you do is use the handheld teach pendant you see here to guide the robot from point to point. It performs the most repetitive, monotonous tasks day in, day out, without complaint. Never tires, never needs a break. It's never absent, and based on a two-year payback, three shifts a day, it works for about $6 an hour, no fringes. And to tell the robot what to do at a particular point, you just use the alphanumeric keyboard shown here. It's a deliberate design of machines and systems to remove decision-making from the worker and to transfer it to another point in the organization where it's far more easily controlled. The idea is to take a job where formerly a worker may have had quite a bit of discretion in the timing of the job. For example, a job done on a bench where you have a lot of different parts and you build a sub-assembly. This job is then put on a transfer line where workers and robots are alternated. So all of a sudden you find that your workmates on either side and across from you are robots. Uh, but it, the problem is more than one of just not having anyone to talk to. Uh, you may begin to talk to the robots after a point. The problem becomes one of the pace of work is set by the mechanical arms on either side. These arms are programmed at a central methods laboratory by time study engineers. So work where you formerly had some control over the pace or the method of operation, those decisions are completely removed. And you find yourself literally trapped between mechanical arms programmed by someone else. You might ask, why are there people there in the first place? And that's strictly an economic decision right now because the sight and feel for robots haven't been perfected to the point where this is economically feasible right now. So that's the sole worth of a human being in the system. But it's not only engineering industries that new technology manufacturers have their eyes on. 
information. Business is besieged by it. All kinds of equipment have been required to manage it until now. Now, with Wang's new integrated information system, one person very simply can perform data processing, word processing, high-speed image printing, and worldwide communication. If Wang can create all this today, who knows what the future holds? Well, the future for a lot of office workers looks very uncertain because one of the main targets of new technology is the office. At present, about a quarter of the American workforce work in offices and half of the entire workforce work in handling information in some form or other. During the 1970s, US industrial productivity rose 90%, while office productivity rose a meager 4%. That's mainly because at present they invest over 12 times as much in industrial machinery as they do in office machinery. But the big companies plan to change that by automating the information industry, as this Xerox film explains. Let us begin our inquiry with technology. It's all here, right now, and functioning usefully for Xerox customers. Document creation given new speed and sophistication. High-speed copying, high-speed printing, document transmission, electronic storage and retrieval, digital and image, and more, much more. Impressive. If the technology is here, can the system be far behind? The main reason why microelectronics is affecting the office area is because it's a very labour-intensive area of work and most managements regard uh, this labour as unnecessary and expendable and would dearly like to get rid of it if they could because it doesn't seem to be productive. Thank you. The offices represent a main source of employment for women so that in fact two out of five of all waged women work in offices at the present time and it's those jobs which are likely to be hit. And as far as estimates are concerned, it seems likely that it's about a, a third of all clerical and administrative jobs that are likely to, to be automated by the introduction of word processors. A French government report also predicts that 30% of banking and insurance jobs will go, while in Germany and Britain it's estimated that roughly a third of all office jobs will be cut within the next 10 years. Another important reason why uh, management is introducing this equipment quickly is because it increases management control. In fact, some of the companies that sell word processors actually say that uh, it's a useful tool for increasing management control, not just the time that people spend in the equipment, but also um, their responsibility and discretion, which is a very human factor in offices. Franco de Benedetti, Joint Managing Director of Olivetti, says... Information technology is basically a technology of coordination and control of the labour force. A factor of fundamental importance in mechanising structured work is the capacity for control that the manager thus acquires. William F. Lochlin, the Vice President of IBM, puts it more bluntly. People will adapt nicely to office systems if their arms are broken, and we're in the twisting stage now. Companies are trying to increase the amount of time spent on expensive equipment because although this equipment is very, very cheap as computers go, it's dearer than a typewriter. And therefore, if it's dearer than a typewriter, the whole of the management idea is to keep you on the machine for as long as possible, as many hours as possible. Okay. They're controlling very, very expensive systems which are getting obsolete at an ever-increasing rate. So employers will seek to exploit that equipment for 24 hours a day so they get the maximum return before it's obsolete. And this has meant that white-collar workers who never previously were pressurized to accept shift working are now being required to do so. Good morning, authorization. May I have your merchant number? Social isolation is also a complaint because you don't need to be supervised by humans a lot of the time. If you make an error, it's automatically thrown up by the software. And therefore, people are complaining also of social isolation, that they're actually separate and apart from the rest of the operations of the business. Well, on your last statement, is it, it oh, Office work is going to become increasingly more and more like factory work. And that management, by using word processors, will be able to exert greater control over how the word processor operator works. Well, look. Can you do this one for me? Because it's very important that we have it on the computer today. 
the idea that suddenly, instead of doing all the, the boring jobs, and there's an awful lot of routine number crunching and, and boring work on computers as well and on word processes, but instead of doing that now, that we'll all sit back and be doing fascinating, interesting, responsible jobs, simply isn't true. Well, my experience is that this type of technology doesn't liberate people at all, that in fact the reverse is the case. It controls the whole environment in which they work and operate. In the field of white-collar work, for example, there are computer-aided design systems for architects, where the architects can no longer think of all the type of architectural elements they might use, but where they're confronted almost like children with a Lego set. They can make a pleasing pattern out of a few little elements, but they can't change the elements because they're said to have been optimized. I think the whole history of automation shows clearly that you can remove routine work and at the same time make the, the job that remains far more monotonous and far less interesting than the job that went before. It seems to me that the jobs that remain, whether in the white collar or in the manual field, will be de-skilled. There'll be jobs in which the worker, whether by hand or by brain, is controlled by the machine rather than the other way round. That they'd be reduced to almost a machine appendage, simply reacting to the system rather than acting upon it and it will give the employers enormous control over them. case where a new technology emerges, if you like, from the laboratory, the, the first question to ask is a political question, namely, for what purposes is this technology to be used? <laughs> new technologies that allow you to shed labour could create a situation where the people who own the factories where they're being applied can make an enormous profit uh, with fewer people who are right or better paid, but the real price is paid by society because the people who are displaced by the new technology become unemployed, they uh, have to be paid for out of uh, taxation, and society then moves towards uh, the social disruption that comes from high technology. The prospect of a long-term dramatic increase in unemployment is predicted in three recent reports. Sussex University estimate that by the end of the 80s, unemployment will rise to 3.4 million. Cambridge Economic Policy Group estimate 4.6 million, and ASTEMS estimate 5.2 million. But there are those who think this anxiety is mistaken. I do totally disagree with the whole thesis that we're heading for 6 million unemployed. I think it's rubbish. I think it's rubbish, and I think it's dangerous talk to give people the idea that there's any base in reality for that if we behave sensibly. Those who behave sensibly accept their own unemployment as the price for higher productivity and profitability for the big companies. What I only wish we could persuade the trade unions to accept is that higher productivity is the friend of full employment. But many organisations in Britain and abroad have their doubts about this and have brought out reports examining the long-term implications of new technology. In the past we've seen slumps but the danger today is not cyclical unemployment as a result of a slump, but built-in structural unemployment as a result of a radical change in the industry in terms of the technology used. In the past, when workers have been replaced by machines, it's been limited to a certain sector of the economy. For example, in the 19th century in the United States, uh, the farm was mechanized, but at the same time, workers were drawn into industry. Uh, in the late 40s and 50s, when automation became popular as a concept, workers were displaced from certain areas of the factory but at the same time they were pulled into the white collar sector but today with the microprocessor we're seeing a form of technology that affects every productive application in the society
One very good example of the lack of awareness on the whole range of industries and services they're going to be affected was shown up in Bradford at Thorn Electrics who make colour televisions and again they were automating the way they make them and so they had to lay off 2,000 women but they decided that they would at least try and retrain some of them so about 200 of them have been retrained at a local college at the expense of the Manpower Services Commission to be typists because there's a lot of insurance companies in Bradford. And so you can imagine the situation, these women who've lost their job, now been retrained, proud owners of a typing certificate, marching boldly to the new insurance company, doubtless to meet the women coming out who've just been replaced by word processors, which have automated the work that they've done. Surely there must be a better way than, than what is going on, because if society, this is just my opinion, if we go, like we are doing. We're going to end up with an awful lot of time in our hands and no money. And that's not funny. We have pieced together our model community of the future. A town which has embraced technology wholeheartedly and taken full advantage of all it has to offer. And leisure is something in which everyone in our community will be encouraged to get involved. A leisure complex in every town containing craft shops, sports facilities, entertainment centres and hotels. We will create a much more humanistic society because basically all the hard work that needed to be done to keep our bodies alive will be done by the robots. If the robots can do the work for us while we lie around in the sun, why not let them? All of these nice little suggestions uh, have one big problem, how do you pay for them? All this stuff about leisure or increased education or whatever is absolutely meaningless given the, our, the present way our society is organised. There is no mechanism for distributing the wealth other than through the wage. And like if people are outside that wage structure then they haven't got anything. It doesn't just get shared out. We don't quite it's all get richer uh, without some definite uh, intervention to try and distribute the wealth. And there's absolutely no sign that there's any thought or intent to do that. It's all right talking about leisure. They talk about leisure, you know, but leisure to me, unless you've got money to enjoy leisure, it's just forced, forced idleness. <laughs> unemployment over the last five, six years particularly, the acceleration of Britain's decline as an economic power uh, and all that has gone with it, have meant that there is a degree of fatalism in the trade union movement, I think on a scale which, uh, which hasn't existed since, since the 1930s. People, people that you don't expect to accept uh, redundancies without a fight are tending to sit back and accept redundancies without a fight. I think it's very important not to totally believe all the doom and gloom because this implies, if one accepts mass unemployment as inevitable, it implies that nobody is able to control either the society or indeed even their individual workplace. If we once allow the complexity of technology to be used as an excuse for not retaining democratic control, then a huge and growing chunk of our future is abstracted from democratic control and then you move towards a technocratic domination of society which is one of the real dangers that science which began as the liberator of man could end up enslaving man by putting its power at the disposal of those who already own our factories or own our newspapers our television uh, stations and in this way impose a tyranny in the guise of liberation
We've got word processors, we've got point of sale systems in retail shops, we've got little mini computers out on the production line, we've got big mainframes gathering information and processing information for certain companies, the large multinationals for instance. We've got all these different applications of microelectronics and the problem is becoming how you knit them all together. Because fundamentally, the microelectronics is being introduced so that the multinationals can organize their very diversified empires, their empires that are spread all over the globe, one at the same time, so that they're able to know what happens at their production plant in Hong Kong, and they're able to know in their New York headquarters as it happens. When we have word processing systems or office systems or data processing systems linked together in different towns and cities and countries by telecommunication systems, it will be possible if there is a strike, say, in London, that management could transmit the work via the telecommunication system to, say, Edinburgh. The ability to run a plant while workers are on strike is also a very real danger. This is as a result of the design of technology to minimize the need for skill or for human experience. Uh, this occurred at the Washington Post in the middle 70s, where management issued a series of ultimatums to the union, precipitated a strike, and then was able to destroy the pressmen's union through the ability to operate the plant while the pressmen were on strike for close to four months. In America, this is now known as electronic scabbing. But to scab electronically, you have to control the communication networks. The driving force behind the convergence of these technologies is increased control for the major multinationals. And they themselves are fighting about who is going to control these networks as they're set up. The battles are going to become quite literally across the whole of the Western world. Out of that battle will emerge one or at the most two corporations who will between them have control of what will in the future be a major means of handling information and then we'll be in a position where a primary life source is controlled by one corporation with enormous profits with very few people and it is able to call the tune for what future developments are. Silicon Valley It's the Wild West all over again Seldom is heard Discouraging words There's no one yet to say them. We've got the know-how We've got the contracts We've got about a hard-working girls Yesterday we won the West Tomorrow we'll win the world International control what we dream of. Control of banking and business data systems, automated manufacture systems, stock storage and retail systems, broadcast entertainment systems, state surveillance and weapon systems, control of satellite telecommunication systems that have the whole little package. International control. That's our plan for the future. And now we'd like to do it to you. One of the remarkable problems for the employer about this kind of equipment is whilst on the one hand it gives him or her great control over the employees, on the other hand it is a fact that the more you synchronize something, and capitalize it, the more vulnerable it becomes. So it now is the case that six designers can go and strike and stop a whole factory because they're producing not drawings, but numerically controlled tapes. And in the past, when they went on strike, they'd leave down the pencil and the rubber. Nobody knew they were gone for six weeks. It's now immediate. Yet companies are planning to overcome this, according to the Institute of Directors. In many larger organizations today, dependence on computer systems has reached the stage where the absence of a handful of computer operators can bring much of the business to a standstill. Safeguards against this can never be complete and must vary from case to case. But it is a problem which management have to face when planning new systems. Systems. The solution or the problem. This is a problem that one American multinational, Xerox, has already faced. 
Anxious that their workforce might not greet new technology with unbridled optimism, they have produced this management training film to forestall possible problems. It's called The Luddite Factor. James Watt invented an interesting toy. The system created the Industrial Revolution. Not without opposition, the new machines eliminated old skills. In England, organized bands known as Luddites smashed the hated machines and rioted to no avail. Their only legacy is their name, Luddites, the resistance to change, overt or otherwise. The Luddite factor is indeed tenacious. Like the earlier Luddites, there is an impulse to turn against the new technology, to strike back. And yet, for most business organizations, it's not a matter of whether, but when. Frightening off resistance by labeling it Luddite is not only limited to company promotional films. The same message creeps into television documentaries, too. Trade unions are shown as deeply suspicious of change, with their roots firmly entrenched in the past. In the early 19th century, the Luddites set out to destroy the machines which they thought would put them out of work. It was just the first manifestation of a general suspicion of technological innovation and change. But was Luddism just a blinkered suspicion of technological change, or was something greater at stake? And just how different was the position of the Luddites to the situation today? I think the most obvious parallel between the introduction of this type of technology and earlier ones has been the de-skilling of skilled craftsmen about 150 or 100 years ago, where the knowledge that existed in the worker, him or herself, their ability to deal with a whole range of complex problems, was gradually taken away from them and embodied in machines like lathes, milling machines, and so on. And that reaches its highest level in numerically controlled machine tools, where completely de-skilled workers do work that previously would have been done a highly skilled worker. And I think we're now beginning to see, repeated in the field of intellectual work, the kind of de-skilling that we saw at an earlier historical stage in the field of skilled manual work. And that brought enormous suffering, in my view, and a whole range of other problems. And far from learning from those problems, we seem determined to repeat them now in the field of intellectual and white-collar work. Although the air is thick with debate, with the microprocessor firmly at the centre of the stage, the debate itself is really already pointless. Today, our world is depending more and more on computer technology, and for some time now, we've been moving down a path from which there's no turning back. Is he right? Is the process of technological change simply inevitable, and one over which there is to be no control? The only way to effectively deal with microprocessor technology and use it in a positive way is to be able to propose, not only to, to have to say no to the introduction of equipment, but to be able to, des to have an input into the design and deployment and use of the technology itself. Technology was made by human beings, and if it's not doing for us what we want, then we have a right and a responsibility to change it. It's not given, it's not like the sun or the moon or the stars. It was designed by people and we could design it differently. And I think this is where uh, people have got to have confidence that even though they may not be a PhD in nuclear physics, they have the authority, the right, to say to the man who's got a, a device, all right, it's interesting and thank you very much, but whether we apply it or not is a political choice between your idea and other options. We've got to understand that we do have a right to control the technology. But when you begin to try to exercise that control, invariably it is rooted in the large multinational corporations. Where that is the case, if effective resistance is built up in one country, they can move it to another. And in any case, they frequently move it to where labor costs are lowest or where the workforce is most docile. So I think there's a massive job to be done in terms of international trade union solidarity. One workforce that has responded internationally are the workers of the Ford Motor Company, one of the most global of all the multinational companies. In November 1980, trade union delegates from all Ford plants worldwide met for the first time in Valencia, Spain. The objective? To formulate a common strategy for bargaining with a company who traditionally have played one workforce off against another. 
The recently launched Ford Escort has been heralded as a world car. But for Ford workers, a world car means a world production line, with jobs, components and cars being shunted from one part of the world to another, seriously undermining national trade union bargaining power. Delegates pledge that in future, local disputes, wherever they occur, would be supported on an international level. Ron Todd, Transport and General Workers Union. Ron Todd, chairman of the UK Ford Negotiating Committee, has no doubts about the usefulness of this initiative. That there is a greater need now for the workers of Fords across the world to get together to coordinate our activities, to exchange our views on how we see the company operating across the world. Now even more than ever is there a need for that. The most important aspect of the Ford conference was that it challenged the whole concept of national competitiveness. But it was clear that more issues united them than divided them. But challenging the idea that nations must compete with each other is not easy. This is going to sound very selfish, uh, but I think to most of our women, while they're in this struggle, fighting for their own survival, it's very difficult for them really to think of somebody in Asia fighting for their survival. Uh, I can understand this, but it doesn't help because the struggle of the women in Asia is part of our struggle it's possible to design equipment which is what I would call human-centered. That is to say that we regard human skill, ability, creativity and sheer enthusiasm as assets rather than liability. And we design the equipment around that rather than seeking to use the equipment to diminish and control it. So the real options, but it seems to me the options are not so much technological questions as political and ideological ones. What kind of society do we want? How do we want people to relate to production and each other? And when we get that clear, then we can design equipment which will allow them to do that. I think the sense of that technology should give people that this is the moment when choices are to be made, rather than this is the moment when you must buckle down and accept the inevitable. This is the key question. And if you can get that straight, then the introduction or the discovery of microelectronics or any other new technology gives people a sense of freedom.